Hello, everybody. Welcome to History Tea Time Chat Live. It's History Tea Time Chat Live, the first one of 2024. Welcome. I hope you've all had a lovely Christmas and the new year has kicked off well for you. So today we are going to talk about conspiracies. We're going to talk about the warming pan conspiracy, sometimes known as the bed pan conspiracy, although I realise that means something different some places. So we're talking warming pan, the old fashioned uh thing you used to fill with coal, stick in a bed, warm it up. That conspiracy. We're going to go over that. But welcome. I'm streaming live on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. Um, and welcome. Thank you for joining me live. Thank you if you're joining on the catch up or if you're listening on the podcast. You can find me on the podcast and all the catch up channels as well if you don't manage to ever, uh, you know, if you're missing a live. Hi, Susan. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Anaga. How are you doing? Uh, watching over on YouTube. I can see people joining on Instagram as well. Welcome. I hope you are all really, really well. And I hope, uh, like I say, that the, uh, the the new year is treating you well uh, so far. Hi, Deborah. How are you doing? So you can support me if you like on Instagram with badges, on Facebook with stars, YouTube with super chats. But of course, the way I would love for you to support me is via Patreon, like AJ, Barb, Mimi, Jude, Julie, Rennie, and Radamandil. Not a real name, I think, but are uh, um, they are they all joined Patreon over the Christmas break. Very excited to to meet them and then be in my Patreon. If uh, if you're in there, remember we have book club this Sunday. We're talking about Tracy Borman's book Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth the First. If you want to be part of book club, then you can absolutely join um, over on uh, Patreon. I should put this up um, scrolling along the bottom of the screen on YouTube so you can all see. Um, uh, you can join me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash British history. Uh, for everyone, whether you're a patron or not, next week, so it'll be out a few weeks after, I am interviewing Elyri Lynn, who wrote, well, she's written a number of brilliant books on uh, fashion history. Um, and I'm speaking to her specifically about fashion at the Tudor court. So I'm interviewing her next week. And some of the, my patrons have very kindly given me extra questions to ask her, which is always a, a bit of a bonus, a, a bit of a benefit, should I say, of being a patron. Um, so I will be speaking to her there next week and I will let you know next week when that is uh, coming out. So uh, that will be something to look forward to. If you haven't already seen and you think you might be interested, have a look at Sex and the Tudors. That's the latest interview that's out on my um, oh, I don't think it's on the podcast. So I need to upload it to the podcast. Uh, but that is on definitely on YouTube. So youtube.com forward slash British history, if you're not uh, following me there already. And that's so Tudor, well, sex in Tudor, England. And that's with Leslie Smith. Very, very interesting chat all about women's health and, 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 uh, and reproduction. Reproduction. Uh, so, hello, Beverly, Melissa, and I'll go again. Oh, your mum didn't know who Amber and Elizabeth Elizabeth first was. Wow. Oh, she didn't know that he was Elizabeth first mum. Right. Uh, Linda, hi. How are you doing? And MJ. No one's got good weather by the look of it. Everyone's either cold or in the rain. I don't mind if it gets cold in the winter. This is okay, but not the rain. Not the rain. That's because I don't like insects. And when we get to next summer, there'll be lots of midges and bitey things. And they love me. So let's get on with this. So any of you have, have any of you heard of the warming pan conspiracy? You might, you might have heard of it when I get going on it and tell you more about it. So this is a conspiracy. I think I titled this uh, stream on um, on YouTube and Facebook, The Birth Which Led to a Revolution. Now, we'll go into it a little bit about whether it did actually kick off a, uh, a revolution or not. But we're in 1688. Now, on the 10th of June, 1688, a baby boy was born at St. James's Palace to the then Queen uh, of England and Scotland, Mary of Modena. She was the wife of James II. So to avoid confusion, this is James II of England and Ireland, who was James VII of Scotland. Has that cleared anything up? Probably not. But when I'm speaking about King James, this is the guy we're talking about. And up until the birth of his son by Mary of Modena, 
his uh, his heirs were his two daughters by his first marriage and his nephew. So Mary and Anne were his daughters and they were his daughters via his first marriage to a lady called Anne Hyde. She died in 1671. He'd remarried Mary of Modena. Um, and we'll get on to, to what happened with their marriage. But his heirs, up till the 10th of June, 1688, when this baby boy is born, his heirs are his daughters, Mary and Anne, and his nephew, William of Orange. Now, uh, his eldest daughter, Mary, had married William of Orange in 1677 at St. James's Palace as well. There's a lot that goes on at St. James's Palace at this point. The couple lived in... William's homeland, the Netherlands, uh, of which he, so he'd ruled there. He's actually William III of Orange and he had ruled there um, from birth or obviously had the, the title of, the position of, because his father had died of smallpox just over a week before he was born. And when he married Mary, she was Princess Mary, she was seven, sorry, she, excuse me, she was 15, he was 37. Um, and she conceived quickly, but she miscarried. Then she became ill the following year and she's not known to have conceived again. Mary's younger sister is Anne, Princess Anne. She would become Queen Anne in the end, although that's not uh, something we're covering today. She married George, Prince of Denmark, um, in 1683, again at St. James's. So, and by the time that her younger half-brother was born, she'd actually lost six children four to miscarriages or stillbirths and um, she lost two daughters to the smallpox and that smallpox all actually also really affected her husband George he, he had health difficulties for the rest of his life um, as a result of catching smallpox um, so um, and Anne had actually already had smallpox so this is why she got away with that um, she, she didn't get ill in that bout of it so the birth of this new baby boy, legitimate baby boy, to their father, the reigning King James II, um, really that should have been a relief for the succession because Mary had married but didn't wasn't conceiving and Anne was married but was her children, you know, again, she was losing children. There isn't actually at this point um, uh, anyone further than that through the, through his daughters. Um, so just to step back a little bit, you've got James who had become king at the death of his brother, Charles II. Um, Charles II, despite having multiple mistresses and despite having multiple children, died with no legitimate heir. And so um, and so he uh, he James became king when he died uh, when Charles died on the sixth of February sixteen eighty five. Remembering, of course, their father Charles the first had been executed. And if you want to know how, uh, I did a video actually about how uh, Charles the first came to be executed in terms of the charges laid against him, which were those of treason. I've got a whole video on that. The interesting part of that is the loops uh, that had to be jumped through, created, and then jumped through in order to try a king for treason when treason is the act that actually is designed to protect the king. But anyway, so that, that's a separate video. If you want to watch that, I will pop the link uh, to that into the uh, into the show notes when I remember. So the, um, the, the, they brought back, obviously, Charles as Charles II in 1660. The landscape, the landscape had become very um, uh, uh, Anglican, Protestant. You know the, 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 that that was the state religion. But Charles and his brother James had been exiled in France, which is a Catholic country. Their mother, Henrietta Maria, is Catholic. Um, now, Charles II trod the line um he uh he clearly had catholic persuasions and he converted to catholicism on his deathbed his brother however um james he had 
it was it was well known that he was absolutely definitely a Catholic. He hadn't taken Anglican community community and excuse me for thirteen years by the time that he became uh, king. And the second Sunday after he became king, he heard mass at St James's Palace. So where Charles had been happy to uh, ignore maybe his uh, his principles to maintain favour and uh, not rock not rock the boat. Bear in mind, of course, he is he is managing a post Reformation um, situation here. Uh, so he, he so Charles had been almost more pragmatic with that. Um, James, however, like I say, he heard mass within t- uh, well the second Sunday after he became king, Catholic mass, and by May of the same year, so only a few months after he'd become king, he had commissioned Sir Christopher Wren to rebuild the Queen's lodgings at Whitehall Palace and create, a, a construct a Roman Catholic church there. A Catholic in the position of head of the Anglican church, which is what the monarch was, um, uh, obviously brings about ideological conflicts, but In addition to that, more practical terms, it affects court ceremony, which is uh, intertwined and linked with church ceremony. Um, So so that causes many problems and concerns. Add to that, you've got James's daughters, Anne and Mary. Well, Mary's out of the country by now. She's obviously married to William and they're in the Netherlands. Anne has stayed, and Anne is um, Anne and Mary were both Protestant, brought up as Protestants by the on the orders of their uncle, who had been the king at the time of their childhood, Charles. So they the, Mary and Anne are brought up as Protestants. So that's why you have the daughters of James II as Protestants, and um, uh, and yet their father James is 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 a Catholic, an open open Catholic when it's not accepted or acceptable as as far as the establishment are concerned um and Anne is at Whitehall she's actually living in uh, apartments created from the cockpit that Henry VIII uh, had built at Whitehall so you've got these two competing contradictory forms of worship still going on James can't whole scale move everything back to Catholicism because too much of his court including that uh, of his daughter are uh, a Protestant and still um, and are practicing Protestants and are definitely not going to change their mind. So you've got unease and unrest growing um, in, in, in the establishment, like I say, and beyond. Um, and Anne would remain Protestant. She was very disapproving of her father and her stepmother's Catholicism. Um, so, but so let's go on. James's queen, so his second wife, Mary of Modena, Modena um, when they married in 1673, she was only 15. He was 40. They do seem to have got on very well. Actually, as does um, Mary II and William III, even with their almost identical age gap. But by the time James II becomes king, they have lost 10 children. They have no surviving children, so should I say, and they had lost 10. Um, the eldest child uh, to survive, well, th- th- reach the age of four, um, a girl named Isabel. So they looked like they were having the same reproductive challenges that James's daughters were having, that Mary and Anne were having. Um, and so for all the issues that... Um, that James's Catholicism was bringing. Um, worst case scenario was we've just got to wait for James at the end of James's life. Then, then we can get back uh, control um, proper uh, to, in, in terms of Protestant, in terms of following the Protestant religion, because his daughters Mary, his uh, um, uh, Mary and Anne are Protestant, and I don't know if I emphasised enough that Mary had married William of Orange. And I don't think I mentioned, so that's now, so William of Orange becomes his son-in-law, of course. He's already his nephew. Mary II and William III, well, William II of England, excuse me, Mary II of England and William III of Orange are first cousins. Just so I'd <laughs> just make that point. 
So very odd. His own nephew becomes his son-in-law. Anyway, there you go. That's the way these things uh, happened at this point and maybe didn't help with the reproductive challenges. Although Anne had her own, they had their own. Um, so when Queen Mary, Mary of Modena, Modena, fell pregnant again, so for the 11th time, the second half of 1687, it actually the couple's reproductive record doesn't seem to have dampened concerns at all. And the, because the serious concern here was, well, Mary hasn't got any children, Anne hasn't got any children. Um, if this pregnancy produces a boy and he survives, then the the Catholic succession, you were going to have a continued Catholic succession because clearly James, now he's king, is going to bring up any new children that he has uh, as Catholics. So, um, so yeah, so the succession it's, it, in one way would have been secured, but it would have been a Catholic one. Um, and it would, of course, supplanted that a boy would supplant uh, James's daughters and his nephew, stroke son-in-law, uh, in the in the succession. So the scrutiny around the royal birth was intense. There was unfounded and spurious rumours from from the moment that the pregnancy, uh, supposedly from the moment the pregnancy was announced, uh, that actually it was a fake pregnancy. The Queen. Isn't, isn't actually you know pregnant at all she's faking it and they're going to smuggle in another baby so like I say the scrutiny around this particular royal birth was intense and the queen not that this was unusual but still I imagine not comfortable was obliged to have witnesses at the birth um and of course so 10th of June 1688 a baby boy was born and he was healthy, it was full term. Um, so his birth from the from Parliament and the Protestant faction of of of, uh, of, of court, but also far beyond, um, was dismay. There were they, there was dismay, and those those spurious rumours turned into pointed accusations um, that the boy was not the real son of James. That um, you know, the boy had been smuggled in, swapped maybe for a stillborn or just, but, you know, because you can start to tell how made up it is when um, the lies themselves or the, the the accusations themselves don't marry up. You know, it was she pregnant at all? Was it a stillbirth? You know, et cetera, et cetera. They don't marry up. But the king was obliged to set up an inquiry to investigate the legitimacy of his own baby boy. Um, I'm pretty sure he was under no question at all that this baby boy was his, but he set up this inquiry for it nevertheless. Um, and during this, there's numerous eyewitness testimonies. Like I say, she um, Mary of Modena was um, uh, obliged to have witnesses at the birth, which uh, originally they wanted, it was going to happen at Whitehall, but she changed that to St. James's Palace. I know someone's asked me about St. James's Palace. So yeah, maybe I'll do a, a particular video on, on St. James's. Um, which of course St James's was built as a nursery palace. It was like the idea was uh, brought about by Anne Boleyn and Henry, and this was going to be the nursery palace for the son they were going to have, um, which obviously didn't happen. So, so like I say, at this inquiry into the baby, the baby James, he's also called James. Uh, there are numerous eyewitness testimonies given, and. There's a small, insignificant detail shared by one of the midwives, and it's seized upon to try and prove, or at least cast enough doubt, that this boy was a changeling, literally been changed over. Margaret Dawson reported that at some point during labour, not even birth, this is during labour, um, a warming pan had been brought in and used to to warm the queen's uh, mattress, they called it, but um, to warm the queen's bed, effectively to make her more comfortable. Now, a warming pan, if anyone hasn't seen, is literally uh, imagine a deep pan with a lid and a long 
uh, handle, which you'd put coal coals into them or something, you know, that, that come off the fire. And it would warm the metal. They're made of metal. They warm the metal. You put them under the sheets, warm up the bed. You know, it's not like a hot water bottle. You wouldn't, you don't cuddle it. That would be bad. Um, but, you you know, you've bought it. That's how you would warm up the bed. Um, and so the warming pan conspiracy was born because this warming pan had been brought into the room when, oh, thank you, Jean, uh, Jeannie, thank you, Jean. Jean, ah, <laughs> That's like I was, sorry, half reading it. Um, so this warming pan had been brought into the room while she's laboring and, um, and clearly then they must have been a baby in there. Clearly. And if you go along the stillborn idea that she'd, she'd given birth, but it was, it, unfortunately the baby had died. Well, then that would be how you'd smuggle the, uh, the baby out or maybe it was a girl and then that she also would have to be smuggled out but the baby had come in in the warming pan clearly clearly um so um to that so that, anyway so that is the the warming uh pan conspiracy how does it lead to uh to revolution well, there's plenty of plenty of people at court who wanted to speed up the accession of James's nephew, William of Orange, uh, like I say, actually would have been third in line to the throne had he not have married James's daughter, Mary, his eldest daughter, Mary. But as he's um, uh, married Mary, they become, uh, he sort of gets bumped up the, the line of succession. So ostensibly, I suppose it'd be Mary, but by virtue of being uh, his, uh, her, excuse me, her husband, and Mary not really being that interested in wanting to rule, by the way. she If she could have had, apparently, if she could have had a little shack somewhere, a, a little countryside cottage with a cow to milk and some woolen cloth to wear in the winter, and she would have been, she would have been happy. So, but there was plenty at court who, who wanted to bring on that accession quicker sooner rather than later. Now, of course, there's a spanner in the works because this baby boy, baby uh, Prince James has been born. Legitimate, healthy, a boy. So, um, uh, yes. So anyway, so we get to there. So those rumours, assertions even, are not only repeated, well, sorry, are repeated confidently by the new baby boy's half-sister, Princess Anne, daughter of James II, in a, in, a, in a letter to her sister Mary. William catches hold of this rumour. There seems to be a lot of, um, it suited people to believe this rumour, so they just pretend, I, I think pretended, you know, to believe this rumour. Well, it's a changeling, it's absolutely changeling, and therefore everything I do is justified based on that. So William of Orange justifies uh, here uh, a, a, effectively an invasion of England. Um, and he invades England in November 1688. So it's it's supposed to be by invitation, um, but he lands in Brixham. Um, MJ, yes, it would have had to be a very small baby. Yes, there are there are holes in this uh, in this conspiracy theory, <laughs> uh, most definitely. So he, yeah, uh, William lands at Brixham and he brings troops. Uh, you know, he brings a, a, a navy. He brings ships. This is the idea that it's a smooth transition. Yeah. Anyway, um, but. James, with his two daughters clearly against him, Mary obviously is going to support her husband. Anne is supporting the conspiracy that this baby isn't uh, isn't real or isn't a, isn't his son. He fle he flees to uh, he flees England to France, where his his son and, and baby have gone. So the baby, by the convention of the time, would have been next in line to the throne. When his father dies, he would have been James the Third of England. But that baby boy grows up with no experience or or uh, memories of England at all. Uh, he is the one derided as the old pretender, 
uh, in Jacobean uprisings of 17, 1715, um, during in response to the reign to, of George I, George of Hanover, Georg, really, of Hanover, who takes over um, when the last of the Stuarts dies, James, James II's daughter, uh, Anne. Well, say last of the Stuarts. He, he's still there. <laughs> James is still alive. Um, uh, no, he's not. Is he? One of them is. James has a son who you may, has a uh, couple of sons, one of whom you may know as Bonnie Prince Charlie. So that's Bonnie Prince Charlie is the grandson of James II. Um, he also leads um, an uprising against, uh, or uh, an invasion against uh, against the Georgians, against the Hanoverians. Um, that is also suppressed. Uh, when, now, I said there's, there's two sons. So Bonnie Prince Charlie, you'll have probably heard about. He, he, he also had a brother. So this baby James went on to have two, two children, Bonnie Prince Charlie and uh, his younger brother, Henry Benedict Stuart. Uh, he, was, he was a religious man. He became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so, uh, but from, so he was actually the last of the line because Bonnie Prince Charlie died without children. Um, now what I might, might interest you is that, um, well, I'll tell you, James II is, uh, was buried in the English, uh, Church of the English Benedictines in Paris, but his son James, so this baby James that started this all off, he is actually buried in St. Peter's Basilica, Rome, as are Bonnie Prince Charlie and his brother, Henry Benedict. So that line actually lived out on the continent till 1807 um, with the final, the, the death of Henry Benedict Stuart, the cardinal, who obviously wouldn't have had children. So, um, yeah, so the warming pan conspiracy. So there is debate whether, well, did that actually lead to the glorious, so this revolution is the glorious revolution, so-called. Um, did that actually lead to it? Well, maybe not, but it was a, it was certainly a catalyst for William invading and taking the throne earlier than was planned, if you like, because he was down. Well, they they he would have succeeded James had James have died without heir. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. I was looking forward to. I I I like. Oh well like that story it's a bit of an odd story I feel very sorry for Mary of Modena I think she was maligned a lot um and um but I'm very glad for her that she had a, a surviving uh, child in the end and I think they had another uh, daughter as well after that on the continent but yeah they all died out over on the continent and have got well three of them have got a very very grand uh, final resting place um thank you so much to everyone um they bought super stickers and yeah i like this would have been yes would have been a very very small baby and the outrage at hey how dare someone be comfortable during labor indeed isn't it isn't it just well it was clearly like it, it through all the testimonies that were given and that was the bit it was it was just opportunistic um to pick out that bit and go oh well, clearly, clearly a baby has got smuggled in here because there was a there was a receptacle for it. I mean, <laughs> as MJ says, it would have to have been a very small baby. Um, I don't know if it was very effective at warming up the bed. I'm joking, of course. But yeah, I'll, I'll maybe look into doing a um, a video on St. James's. Perhaps I will do that as a Patreon video um linda says i believe i read just yesterday that st james is is being open more regularly for tourists is that true i don't know i haven't uh, i haven't seen it but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not been said um but that would be great it was fascinating seeing the inside of st james's palace of course at the accession of um king charles iii to actually see inside and see the accession council happening there that was that was incredible wasn't it um, uh, Melissa, yes. How could the first cousins marry? Yeah, dispensation. Um, 
Well, no, there's no need for a dispensation from the Pope because they weren't Catholic. Um, but I don't know how that came about. Other than it was it was a match that everyone seemed happy with for some reason. Um, but I, yes, I mean, uh, what we, I mean, I, I, I was about to say what we know about reproductive health and the gene pool, but I think they had an idea of that as well. Um, yeah. Amanda says probably would have warmed it nicely. <laughs> All right, how long would this baby have had to wait in the in the pan as well, being really quiet while she's still giving birth to, or pretending to give birth to, or giving birth to the stillborn baby? I, I mean, clearly it doesn't add up. But the vigour with which Princess Anne um, believes or pretends to or does believe this story is quite staggering. There is a great biography of Queen Anne by Anne Somerset um, if you're on Facebook or YouTube and in the show notes I've put details of that book and I was uh, maybe shock's not the right word I was taken aback by how adamant uh, Anne or how committed to pretending or like I say or actually believing this clearly made up conspiracy theory um for the sake of religion was quite staggering for her 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 religion most certainly came above her um her family ties and well, father i mean this is her father and her father was supposedly heartbroken uh that his daughters had um uh you know had um uh, gone against gone against him um so yeah i have uh a few videos on on things related to this so I, if, if i remember i will pop that uh, i'll pop oh, I will, i'll pop those links in the uh, in the show notes so um you can uh find me live again tonight so i'll tell you about this some of you are history after dark uh hadders you are history hadders if you're not then please do come and join us tonight we're history underscore after Hun underscore dark excuse me on youtube uh we are on facebook uh, excuse me we are on instagram history dot after dot dark but we are uh just go there to find links to to our shows this year so last year 2023 was the year of the deceased git and we went through 26 candidates for git of the year and we went through why there were gits or why maybe they weren't. And some turned out not to be as gittish as we thought. And they all got a score. And we had a deceased git league table. 2024 is the year of the history hero. They will get the same treatment. Why are they considered heroes? And then let's actually have a look and see uh, whether they are heroes or not. And tonight we are beginning with the one who not only survived, but thrived, Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII's fourth wife, the one who you'd like at the negotiation table if you're going through a divorce, apparently. So we're going to be um, we're going to be looking at Anne of Cleves tonight. So if you want to join us for that, like I say, eight, well, I didn't know if I did tell you the time, 8.15 tonight, UK time. Please work that out where, what time that is where you are. History underscore after underscore dark channel on uh, on youtube i think you can just go into youtube and search for history after dark and uh, that is already scheduled so you can click there for a notification when we go live and i'll be there with dr cat and with catherine so this is our first that first one of 2024 as well um so melanie says i've never heard this story before as an american i need to learn more about 18th and 17th century monarchs uh, well, so I can maybe help you out there a little bit. So we have, uh, is it biannual when something happens twice in a year? Twice a year, we create online history festivals uh, and we have done three so far. We've done the Stuarts, we've done the Georgians, obviously the Stuarts come under what we're talking about today, um, not that this particular story was in there. But uh, then we've done the Georgians, which overlaps with the Stuarts. 
And then we have done the Tudors and we are about to do a Stuart's Return as well at the end of March. But if you missed those online history festivals and you would like to uh, see the talks, you can still do that. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Philippa, P-H-I-L-I-P-P-A, and you can buy the bundles of talks. Or alternatively, if you are going to come to the next online history festival, you can go to the Stuarts, S spell S T U A R T S, 2024.eventbrite.co.uk. And as an add on to your ticket for that, you can buy any or all or two out of the three, whatever talk bundles from those online history festivals. And we've had amazing speakers talk on them. Um, uh, uh, Sorry, I was just looking at the video I did on Anne and Henry's divorce. Oh, thank you. So I did one about the love letters as well. Was that is that that one? Um, uh, so yeah, <laughs> and now I've got the Stuarts has had two sections because of the interregnum. See what you did there. Nice, nice. So we have Dr. Alice Hunt talking about the interregnum on the one coming up. Just a segue into that. Uh, but we've had people like Gareth Russell. Gareth Russell has spoken on everyone. He's speaking on the next one actually as well. He's give, doing a talk about James the First Wife, Anne of Denmark. Um, we've had Tracy Borman speak on the last three. Uh, uh, Professor James um, uh, uh, Clark talking about the dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, Dr. Cap Marchant talking on all sorts of things, including on one and the Georgians Ben knuckle boxing uh, and. Um, Oh, SJ. So SJ, the real cause of the divorce. Sorry, I know where you are now. Yes. So Anne of Cleves and Henry VIII's um, divorce. My interview with um, with Heather Darcy. Yes. Sorry, I'm with you now. So yes, Anne of Cleves. Sorry, back to Anne of Cleves. Jumping about here a little bit. But um, if you're interested, I, I will warn you, Heather has parrots. And they are jealous when she talks on the on the phone or on on uh, we were on Zoom. So if you can listen and try and ignore the parrots, then it's an incredibly interesting interview. Um. So yes. Anyway. So yes. If you if you're interested in any of those talks, you can buy them as a bundle. I've kept the price really low, um, so that it's as accessible to as many people as possible. If you're a patron, remember that with the the uh, the next online history festival, you of course get discounted tickets. Um, because why not? Uh, so I think that's about it for now. If you again, if you're a patron member, we've got book club on Sunday evening. If you're not a patron and you'd like to be in book club, come along and join patreon.com forward slash British history. We would love to see you there. Um, uh, Deborah says, uh, I'd like to see who plays devil's advocate. What makes last year's gift as a hero this year? <laughs> so what we didn't do last year, which we realised, was ever really summarise why each candidate was considered a git. So this, this year for History Heroes, we're going to just do a little summary as to why he these people are considered heroes. And then we'll delve in to, um, to what they were really like. And we'll make our our assessment of them, which I'm sure they'd be very happy with. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, cool. So, um, oh, and yes, so I think I've said everything now. So, yeah, get your tickets for Stuart's Online History Festival. If that's up your street, you can get hold of the talk bundles. If you want to go on their own, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Philippa and buy them there. Or you can get them as an add-on to your ticket. Join me for HAD tonight. We're talking about Anna Cleves, uh, along with Dr. Kat, obviously, and Catherine Ibbotson. Um, if you want book club, that's in Patreon as well, and I'll see you Sunday night. And uh, if you're interested in a bit of sex in Tudor England, then check that out on uh, YouTube, and I will get that uploaded to the podcast as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining me back on my first live of 2024. I hope to see you tonight, or if not, I will see you next week where we're going to be talking about the coronation of Elizabeth I. Okay. All right then, everybody. I'll see you really soon. Bye.